this is a time lapse of a female head study that I have sculpted inside a ZBrush just a few days ago. The whole video is narrated. What is going through my mind? What am I thinking about? What am I focusing on? So that you get to appreciate the thinking side because I think that that's very important. This whole head that you're looking at will be released to all Outgang members who have a membership on Outgang.studio. So if you like this head, you would like to download it, you can do that with an Outgang membership. So we start with a sphere that we convert to a Dynamesh. I keep the resolution of the Dynamesh at 128. Eventually we will make it higher to 56 and higher than that. But 128 is actually a pretty good starting point. It allows us to concentrate on the major shapes of the face without having to really worry about the details right now because we don't have the resolution for that. The first thing that we start really is to block out the major shapes of the face. We really want to concentrate ourselves on what we call the primary volumes of the face, which for the most part are given to us by the skull and the jaw. So everything that is bone or cartilage in a face contributes in a major way to what we call the primary volumes of the face. And we want to start with that first. We want to try and really concentrate on those. If we are working on a likeness, and it is really important for us to capture exact shapes that we have on our references, then we would be very careful with the primary volumes of the face, and we re would really spend quite a lot of time to really refine them. Now, in this case, this is more of a generic female study in a way, in the sense that I'm not really trying to go for an exact likeness here. You can see that I have different references of different uh, women. My process right now is more or less just to look at different references and, and simply look for features that I find are inspiring. So I can take a few liberties here and there if there's any sort of shapes that I want to emphasize. I have quite a lot of liberty here. I'm more or less trying to design this head as I go along. Now, at this point, I really am only concentrating myself on the primary details. There simply isn't really at this point enough information on the face that we can really go and try to give a specific morphology, perhaps, just other than a very generic one at this point. We really start by simply trying to capture the shape of the skull. And to be honest, at this point, any generic skull would probably work. But like I said, if you're trying to make an actual, actual likeness, you really want to try to capture someone very specific, then you would probably spend your time between looking at actual skull references and trying in your mind to see how those skull references that you're looking at really translate in the actual references that you have. How are those shapes modulated in the reference that you have, in the likeness that you are trying to capture them? But yeah, since this isn't a likeness, I have a lot more liberties. It also allows me to work a lot faster. Truth be told, doing likenesses is something that takes a long time to do. And trying to do a likeness versus a more freeform study, I suppose, will have a major impact on the time it's going to take you to produce your face there. You can definitely spend twice as much, three times as much time when working on, on a likeness because it's very critical that you really, really read the shapes really, really properly and that you really spend a lot of time to be careful there. When you are using references like these, what I try to pay attention to really is the different plane changes. I try to really read the light in a way. People who start with references like these and haven't really done a lot of facial sculpting will have a tendency to look at the silhouette of the faces that we have on our references and really try to copy that. There are some pitfalls when you are trying to simply do an exact copy, if you will, of a silhouette of a reference because, you know, you have to deal with things like camera distortion, you have to deal, there may be things in the way like hair that is kind of stopping you from reading accurately the silhouette there. You do want to be wary of the silhouette in your references, but most importantly, what you really want to pay attention to when you have some really good references, you really want to pay attention to how the light reacts with the surface and really how the light helps to bring out certain volumes that you otherwise perhaps wouldn't necessarily see. It's very important for me to get references that are very high contrast in terms of lighting. Now, these particular images aren't necessarily the most high contrast when it comes to lighting. I think the image that is on the top right now is a bit more successful at that, perhaps, because we feel as if the light is coming from the bottom, and so we can read some really nice shapes on the lips, on the cheeks, uh, on the chin as well. 
you really want to be hunting for those. You want to be looking for those references that really have these highly contrasted lighting. Almost like you almost want to be looking for references that have bad lighting in a way. One of my favorite sources of reference gathering, if you will, is movies and TV shows because I simply find that when you watch a show with a particular actor or actress that you like, you will often have these highly artistic or interesting lighting set up around their faces and you can really use that to your advantage. Look at how the different shapes, the different primary volumes, the different the secondary volumes of the face are all sculpted by the light, quite literally. Since that's pretty much all we see really, it's just how the light reacts with the surface and that's really the only thing that we can really interpret if you really think about it. You can see that I am moving on to what we would consider to be more of the secondary shapes. If the primary shapes of the face are more or less the shapes that are given to us by the skull and the main cartilage over the ear or the, or the nose itself, then we would consider the secondary shapes of the face to be everything that is given to us in terms of shapes by the muscles and facial fat pads of the face. We will go for tertiary details being uh, surface details at that point, uh, so things like uh, skin pores, wrinkles, these sorts of things. You can see that I'm really building this head as if I started by kind of building a very, very simple version of the skull. And now I'm simply adding in all the missing different muscles, fat pads, these sorts of things. Very important to always be rotating around uh, so that you can really look at your model from every angle. Don't only look at your model from front view or side view or three quarters, which are you know what you will probably be doing most of the time. Uh, it's really important that you really try to look at your model from a low angle or a high angle. And if you can even get references from those particular angles, they will really help you to read the shapes that you have over your head a lot easier there. The thing with references that's really tricky is because they're all 2D pictures, therefore it's really hard to read any sort of depth, you know, like we think that we were kind of able to interpret depth, but truth be told, like it's very, very easy to be led astray when looking at pictures from front view, side view and three quarters when it comes to the more subtleties of uh, shape and depth of the different features that we have on head. This is uh, Megan Rapino, I believe that's how her, her family name is pronounced. I think she's a great reference personally because I really like to have not only these superstars, these actresses, and I certainly have some of those, but I absolutely, absolutely like to have references of people who don't fit the traditional bill, I guess a celebrity of some kind, you know? At this point, I believe she's quite famous, but she's a soccer player, so, you know, it's pretty much what she does all day. I find that her her face really communicates, like, a life well-lived, and there's a naturalism that I really appreciate in it, that I really like to have in references, you know, so that I can bring more naturalism and realism to my sculpture here.
for the eyes, as you can see, I started from a sphere. I have scaled the sphere down because it was obviously way too big in the scene to begin with. And what I'm doing here is that I'm just using the transpose line of ZBrush and I'm really trying to simply measure it so that the, the diameter of it really comes out to about 25 millimeters because that is the standard more or less standard width for eyeballs for humans. Now, if you jump into things called anthropometry and what have you, you'll see that there is a bit of a range of a few millimeters for eyeballs, but you can be pretty safe by doing eyes that are 25 millimeters across. I also feel that it's important to deviate the eyes a little bit from their center of gaze. And uh, there is something called angle kappa. Natural human eyes do not point straight ahead. They're actually deviated by a few degrees on the outside. And the reason for that is because uh, at the back of the eyeball, you have both the optical nerve and the fovea that are fighting for the space. And therefore the fovea isn't completely centered, which means that the eyeballs have to be slightly rotated so that fovea can catch the, and have in focus whatever is straight ahead. As you can see, so I'm, I'm simply continuously refining. One of the things that I do that I think is very, very important to do is to always be rotating around your 3D model and not spend too much time on a particular zone. I feel that this is something that happens a lot when people do faces, but perhaps more generally, just 3D art in general, we have a tendency to get bogged down to the details. We'll, we'll like isolate something. We'll like isolate an eye or the nose or the mouth or something. And we'll just concentrate ourselves on that for a long time. And we'll really kind of try to really make it as good as it can. But we kind of develop that kind of tunnel vision, if you really think about it, with these kind of features. And the problem with that kind of tunnel vision is that afterward, often once you unhide whatever you had hidden to concentrate yourself on it, You'll have that particular zone of the head be at a degree of completion, if you will, that is much further along than all the rest of the head that you have or the sculpture that you have. And things actually start to, to not be as uniformly pleasing. If you spend too much time on a particular zone too early on, you will start to feel a bit of preciousness for these details that you have added. And that's also problematic because sometimes the key to uh, improving a likeness, improving a face, improving anything really, you kind of have to take a step back sometimes. You know that sort of saying of take one step back and two, and two steps forward? I think that's very true when, you, when you're doing sculptures. Like there often is a moment where you more or less have to kind of go back over something that you've sculpted before to simply make it better or to make it so that it integrates itself better with whatever else is around it. And if you develop a bit of preciousness for the work that you have too early on in the process, you run a risk of, of resisting to make a change to your model that would actually be to the benefit of the model, but you may not be realizing that at the moment, or maybe you even are realizing it but you're just too afraid of changing whatever it is that you have sculpted previously and spent a lot of time on because you are afraid that if you do so, you will not be able to make it as good the second time around. And that kind of preciousness can be, can be pretty bad. It's something you really want to avoid as much as possible.
I'm always constantly changing zones. I just work on one zone for a small amount of time, and then I quickly move on and I go and I work on something else that's right next to it. I don't necessarily wait until something is perfect. I simply want to make sure that whatever I'm working on looks better to me than how it looked before. And once I feel that I've made meaningful progress on a particular zone, then I will simply put it aside and I will move on to the next zone. And I will do that process over again, you know? I'm not worried at this point about making things perfect. I simply want things gradually everywhere to improve at the same rate. If it's just a sketch that you're doing, if it's just a study, you don't necessarily have to spend like days and days on it. Like truth be told, you can easily do a study of a head in like 60 minutes or so. You can just spend 60 minutes, sculpt the head just for the sake of it, look at your references, and after 60 minutes, you just call it quit, you know? And you can even look at it the next day and kind of look at your work and, and really ponder what you've done well, what you haven't done well, what you would like to improve the next time around. You'll be better able to have a, a, a better perception of your own work if you don't get attached to your own work midway through creating it there. It's a lot easier to give up on something that you haven't personally became too attached to, if you will. At this stage, you don't want to get married to your work. You always want to be moving around the surface. You want to be continuously improving everything left and right. Any point of the production of this particular head, if this was in a production environment, at any point really, I could stop working on this head and I could simply show it to my art director or to anyone else and I could get valuable feedback from them. And I wouldn't mind showing off my work. You know, there's nothing worse than simply spending two hours sculpting a nose, unhiding the rest of the face, and none of the rest of the face has been done so far. And then you have your art director who walks over. It's like, hey, I kind of want to see what you're working on. And all you have is this nose that is otherwise sitting on this empty head. You know, that's a very sad, that's a very sad view, unfortunately. If you improve the quality of everything consistently because you are always moving over the surface, you're simply hunting for little things that you can improve left and right. And if there's something you haven't done to your degree of satisfaction, it's okay. You can just catch it the next time that you work on that particular zone, you know? If you do that process, you will find that uh, your skills will improve a lot faster. You'll be less attached to your work. So here I'm con continuously refining the shapes left and right. As you can see, it's really a process. Like this is really a process from working from bigger to smaller, really, which is really what's at the heart of thinking about things in terms of primary, secondary, and tertiary details. I still want to be refining the primary shapes. If there's something about the primary shapes of the skull that I think can be improved, I usually want to treat these things as a priority. In a lot of cases, I don't even do tertiary details, you know, like I'm not going to do skin pores because the more you go from primary towards tertiary shapes, the less important they are to uh, be able to read the face and feel as if you've done a proper job or not. At this point, you can see that I've also increased the resolution. I've done this quite a while ago at this point. I've increased the resolution of the Dynamesh. 
we started at 128, we are now uh, over 400. There isn't really a magic number here. Um, in fact, I really like to keep the number as low as possible for the longest amount of time. But there is a point once um, you're reasonably satisfied with your, your first pass, if you will, on the primary shapes. And you really want to start to concentrate yourself on trying to really build some nice muscles, uh, some interesting fat pads. Uh, there does come a time when you really have to increase that resolution amount. And that's completely fine. Honestly, though, I, I really, really don't want to get attached to this kind of head at this particular point. Um, well, first, because I do know that this is a sketch. Like, I don't necessarily have the ambition of, of making a a longer project for this. Although I do always reserve for me the uh, the possibility of doing that. You know, like if I do work on a sketch for a head, and I realize at the end of it that I've done a particularly good job at it. I'm really proud of the work that I've done. Then there's a high chance that I'll consider maybe uh, doing a longer project that has that head uh, inside of it. And I like to kind of do that, you know, like instead of trying to start projects where I start a project and then I have all these big ambitions at the beginning and that happens way more than it probably should even uh, with, with all the experience that I have. Um, but I, 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 I try to fight that as much as possible. I try to fight the urge of uh, being overly ambitious when I haven't even laid a brick. More and more as my career goes on, really, um, I try to fight that particular mentality of, of being overly ambitious at the beginning, and I really try to go more for the mentality of um, planning less in the beginning um, and simply having more fun having more fun inside a ZBrush, just being like, yeah, you know what, I'll just grab a bunch of different references and I'll just sculpt the head just for the sake of it. And I don't really know where it's going to take me, but um, I know that I'll be spending only a few hours on this. And so at the end of it, if it doesn't work out, totally fine. If it does work out, then that's also great. But in both cases, uh, I'll come out ahead uh, because even projects that you work a few hours on um, and that you iterate on and that you realize that you don't really like them all that much, still it's very easy to just put them aside and still feel as if you've walked away with better knowledge than what you have started with. Um, I'm a big believer in knowledge and really developing that. And so there is really nothing better to develop your own knowledge of facial anatomy than to simply go in that mentality of just being like, yeah, you know what? I'm just gonna sculpt a random head tonight. I'm just gonna grab a bunch of different references. You know, maybe I'll try doing a likeness, maybe not. But instead of always planning things ahead, just uh, try to be a bit more spontaneous with just jumping in ZBrush, grabbing a bunch of references and just spending like 60 minutes or a bit longer than that and just having some fun sculpting inside of ZBrush really. And yeah, like once you do that and you have something that really is solid, you can maybe consider whether that could insert itself into a longer project. You could make it so that every evening over one week for let's say five days straight from Monday to Friday, literally the only thing that you do every night after work or once you're home or something else, you simply spend that time sculpting ahead that very night. And you know that, let's say you time box yourself, you're like, okay, I got two hours, I'm gonna spend two hours on this head. Maybe I'll start by spending 15 minutes simply gathering references and I'll spend the rest of it doing some sculpting. There may be heads in there that are particularly successful and that you really feel strongly about. It's like you've spent, you've spent only a small amount of time, but you really feel as if there's one of those particular five heads that really speaks to you a lot more than the other ones that you have produced. And then it's very easy then to let yourself sort of 
start to have these flights of fancy of what kind of project could this, could this turn into? What kind of character could I build around this particular head that I've done a really good job at? The outside of the iris, if you will, that exact border that separates iris from what we will call the sclera, which is the white of the eye, that's about 11 millimeters across. There's a range of a few millimeters. People have irises that are slightly wider and slightly narrower than that, but the range is really just of a few millimeters. So when I'm making irises, I really try to go for um, 11 millimeters across. So simply by going for eyeballs that are 25 millimeters across and then going for irises that are about 11 millimeters across, doing that will give you 90% of the work in making eyes that are believable in terms of size, in terms of... And of course, if your whole head is at a scale, then that's even better. Let's move on to doing hair a little bit. So, as far as the hair is concerned, I'm using fiber mesh, and the way that I usually start it is with a very, very low dynamesh, as you can see. I went into the polygroups menu, and I've put the polygroup by normal angle at the lowest possible value, which is one, and then I did a polygroup by normal. And what that does is that it essentially separates every polygon that you had as a separate polygroup which makes it so that when you grow hair from it afterward, the hair will inherit the polygroups. Using this kind of trick, you can make it so that you can have all these nice little clumps of hair that are nicely separated for you. As you can see, when I turn on the wireframe, you can see the different colors that are in there. Those are all the different polygroups. And these will become very, very useful for us very, very soon. Because what these things do is that they allow us to use different brushes and mask those brushes using auto masking. If you were to go to the brush menu and go into auto masking, you would be able to find something called mask by polygroups. It's a slider and if you put the slider at 100%, then your brushes will only affect the polygroup on which you are clicking. What I'm doing is just a very general pass on hair flow. You know, just I'm just making sure that the general flow of hair right now and the length of hair is pretty good, that I'm relatively satisfied with that. As you can see, I'm using the move brush at this point. If you use a move brush and you turn on, that also I believe is in the brush menu, auto mask fiber mesh, you will be able to use your move brush to move around different fiber mesh hairs that you have. I actually use a lot of default brushes when I do sculpting for hair. For some reason, I think it's just a question of personal habit, really. Uh, but I find that the move brush, uh, there is also Groom Lengthen that does pretty much the exact same thing. And if you ever look at the tooltip for that brush, you'll see that it is actually a move brush.
Here I'm starting to use the Groom Spike brush so that I can start to have a bit more spikiness, a bit more dynamic. And what I'm gonna do, I will start to go and pull on every one of these little pile groups that were created because of the low res dynamish that this hair originated from. And I'm quite literally pulling on every little clump using that auto mask mask by poly group feature on the groom spike brush. And I'm quite literally just turning every little clump of hair into a little spike. Because I just find that it gives a nice volume to the hair. It kind of gives a nice style, you know, like I'm, I'm a big fan visually of the kind of style that it gives. So I have tendency to do that. But in this case, the reference is quite explicit. So I'm quite happy to oblige. This simply takes a while. You have to give it a lot of elbow grease, unfortunately. And it gives a really, really great result, visually speaking. Now, because this is a sketch, I'm not gonna spend the time necessary to really make sure that everything's highly polished left and right. In the end result, there, there are a few hair clumps that would need a bit more refinement, but I figured it was good enough for for a sketch, you know, I'm kind of always keeping in mind that at this stage, I want to be doing quick iterations. If I was producing this for a production, if I'm st starting to work on this head in the morning, I would want to make sure that I can have something to show to my team at the end of the day there. I can have something that kind of really captures the essence of the character and that I have something to show. So I'm always working on, with the mentality that whatever I'm doing has to be done very quickly when I'm in the beginning of uh, producing a character or something because I think that if I can capture the essence of something and I can do so in half the time that it would otherwise take me in another context, I can use that half of the time that I have saved on something else if I want. Uh, I can get valuable advice from my team, I can get valuable advice from the art direction and uh, I can see whether I am following the proper course or not uh, or the proper style. It's a bit of a fine line, perhaps, between working quick enough that you are making meaningful progress and simply being a bit too sloppy with your work. There's a bit of a fine line there. But yeah, so I do treat the hair as a sketch, just like I treat the face. This would likely be redone. If this was for a video game production, I probably wouldn't be using the fiber mesh directly, although that can be possible. That did happen in the past uh, when working on projects that had hair systems integrated inside the engine that was similar to things like Hairworks from NVIDIA or TressFX. These kind of systems that support spline-based hair in real time, fiber mesh is actually quite good to use in those cases because, as you can see, fiber mesh is quite, quite fast. There is something very, very liberating about doing fiber mesh, I find, because you don't have to leave ZBrush. It's also highly artistic in how you approach it, which always brings a lot of satisfaction, I feel like. So in a lot of cases, fiber mesh really is only uh, a, a sketching tool for hair, but I find that it's a very, very good one at that. And it simply helps you to capture the essence of the character very, very quickly there. I will say that fiber mesh isn't something that is uh, usually easy to do. It's not something that's very easy to control. It takes, it takes a lot of experience to be able to Pull it off well. It takes practice, but that's true of everything, really. So I like here to use just a groom uh, blower brush a little bit, or I'll use other brushes as well, just to get the hair to just perhaps open up a little bit more and uh, get a bit more coverage out of it. Here I'm back at using the move brush to do some final adjustments. I like to also combine the move brush with AccuCurve. I like to turn that option on, on the brush itself because it simply helps to, uh, I simply like the fall up that the move brush inherits when using AccuCurve on it. And if you don't know where AccuCurve is, you will find it in the brush menu under the curve menu. Simply have to go to brush and you have to go to curve and you will find the AccuCurve option in there.
Once you have the hair in place, it helps to, it will probably change your perception of certain details that you have left and right. It simply helps to have a more complete representation of the character. Still using that groom spike just to try to get a, a very nice uh, spikiness going on to the bottom of the hair here, uh, towards the back of the neck. Let's move on to producing the clothes then. In my case, I kind of wanted to go for, I guess, something perhaps a bit wintry. I suppose because it is winter as uh, we are reckoning this, and it was kind of a bit of the inspiration there. I knew I wanted to go for something that was a bit of a scarf around the neck, and I wanted to go for uh, some type of some type of jacket or something. Um, I really didn't have the ambition to make clothes or make a body for this character, but I did want to just dress her up a little bit and have something around the neck and over the shoulders there. So I decided to go for something that was very, very simple, um, simply because it's really not the focus of the character itself. So whatever drapes over the shoulders and even the scarf to a certain extent shouldn't be that complicated in terms of detail. And just even in terms of execution, since the focus, I really want the focus to be the head there. I shouldn't be spending as much time on the clothes as I am spending on the head because I want people to look at the head more than, more than look at the clothes, although I do want them to also look at the clothes and feel as if the clothes is really bringing something interesting, uh, is really helping to, to sell maybe who the character is. The fact still is that I, I, I really want to treat these clothes as some very sketchy clothes. It would take a lot more time to go and Marvel's designer and try to really simulate something there. And again, because this is a sketch, I really just want to give people a, a feeling for what the character would actually look like. Then I decided to just sculpt everything by hand, really sculpt all the folds uh, going on, on on the scarf itself. It's really not that hard to do. Um, ultimately, you more or less just want to be following a breakdown of folds that more or less follow diamond folds as we have explored in the cloth anatomy video. You simply want to be doing folds that are more or less diamonds that sort of slot in and insert into each other. So as long as you can kind of do that, to be told, you'll, you'll be totally fine. Like you're, in a lot of cases, that will be enough for most people looking at your model to feel as if you've done some relatively realistic and interesting folds. So I try to always be thinking in terms of diamonds, especially when I'm going very freestyle like this, because it's a very safe shape to rely upon. But of course, you know, these are diamonds that are highly organic. Now, these aren't completely diamonds because there is a bit of a twist in the scarf that I want to represent, you know? I want it to look as if one side of the scarf is overlapping the other side when you look at a character from front view. So these aren't strictly diamonds, but Wherever I can, really, I, I try to more or less just integrate a bunch of diamonds in there because I know that that is most commonly the kind of shape cloth will have a tendency to take. I'm also using the exact same brushes I've been using for sculpting the face. Uh, these are the same brushes I use all the time in every context, really. So I he heavily rely on clay tubes and clay buildup. These are pretty much what I use most of the time to do sculpting. And it's true whether I'm sculpting organic characters, whether I'm sculpting hard surface characters, 
flows, what have you there. I pretty much always rely on these two brushes to sculpt everything. I do like to leave a lot of that uh, information over the surface. When you use the clay brushes, you often wind up having these very highly visible strokes that are left over the surface. I really like to keep those personally. I like the kind of, I just like the kind of flavor, the kind of style that it gives really. you could polish the surface of a sketch to a point where it's too polished for it being a sketch. And therefore people stop interpreting it as a sketch and they start interpreting it as a final polished piece, but that is otherwise uh, devoid of tertiary details. And that often gives people a bit of a a weird feeling, you know, because there's a bit of a clash there between the highly polished surface that you have sculpted for your primary and secondary details with the fact that there are no tertiary details to speak of. So I don't like to overly polish my surface. Uh, I try to use the smooth brush as little as possible so that my surface always keeps that very sort of sketchy feeling that it has. I also find that truth be told, even when I do make a polished piece and I do decide to slap on a bunch of skin pores and wrinkles over a face, if there is information that is left over from using your sculpting brushes, your clay brushes, it's really possible to overdo it. That is definitely possible. But more often than not, I find that it kind of gives a really nice feeling to the surface. After you add skin pores, after you add wrinkles, these sorts of things, the surface still looks really, really good. And those, those little artifacts that we're talking about, they just, they get merged with the tertiary details. They get merged with the skin pores. They get merged with the wrinkles. And they simply make the surface look more realistic. If you like this, if you appreciate this kind of content, please subscribe. This head is also available to Outgang members. I decided I was going to give it away to members. So now moving on to the rest of the jacket that isn't there. You can see that I'm still sculpting this out. Uh, started from cylinder, I've cut out the center of it using clip circle. And now I'm basically just refining this so that it more or less has the shape of a collar there. Now, there's a lot of different techniques I could have used to create these. Ultimately, th this probably isn't the most optimal technique. What I'm doing right now, I probably even should have perhaps started with polygons, move the polygons around, uh, and then eventually give it thickness using panel loops or uh, perhaps using a Q mesh or something else. I definitely could have done that and it probably would have been more optimal in terms of workflow, but I was in a sculpting setting and I decided, yeah, you know what, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna treat this just like I've treated everything else and I'll uh, I'll challenge myself at trying to sculpt this very thin circular kind of shape there to the collar. Using the H polish brush is great. When you have these kind of like thin, very hard edges, Edge polish, if you use it well, you can really make the thickness of whatever shape that you have a lot more consistent just by careful usage of the edge polish brush. So there's only a few things missing on this. First, we're just going to add a piece of, uh, what would be a piece of cloth that would be over the shoulders themselves.
What I've done, I've duplicated the head. I have simply erased all of the head itself so that I only had the clavicles and the shoulders left. And I'm simply sculpting on this as if uh, it was now a very thick piece of cloth. While I was producing this, I really had, I really had to fight that urge of being like, oh, like what kind of bigger project could I do with this? Um, even the scarf, like I'm actually quite happy with the result there, like visually speaking for a sketch. But then again, I was kind of thinking, I'm like, yeah, but I could probably import this inside Mars Designer, or I could just redo it inside Mars Designer. It would look actually better, you know. Um, it's very, very easy to let that kind of uh, that kind of mentality sort of creep creep up on you because before you know it you're like well okay I mean it's gonna look better for the scarf if I just do it inside of Mars Designer it's just gonna take me a day right or and then you do it and then you realize afterward you're like oh well this actually looks a lot better than everything else oh why don't I give this kind of treatment to something else that's right next to it right and then before you know it this sketch that you were only supposed to work on for one evening has now suddenly turned in this huge project once more that you cannot see the end of so you really have to pay attention to that kind of, that creeping, you know, that sort of creeping effect of just saying like, oh, but I could actually, if I spent a bit of time on this, I could actually make it better. Or if I took this outside of ZBrush, I, I think that may be the most important one. But you could also want to maybe move on to a subdivision approach to these dynamish pieces. You could want to move on to a subdivision approach. Now there's really nothing wrong with that, but that often also comes with an increase in complexity and time spent on the project. So when you are working out on a sketch, you have to really ask, what do I gain by moving on to a subdivision approach? Usually what you gain is a bit more resolution, a bit more ability to sculpt high frequency details, so tertiary details. You get that kind of benefit when you move on to subdivision. But then again, if you do want to do a large shape change for some reason, then you're also kind of stuck with that. And then it becomes a lot harder to do major shape changes because that stretches your lowest subdivision level and then you have to maybe re-Z remesh your piece or something else. The pipeline becomes a lot more complicated. So I try to always avoid, like if I'm sketching something out, I'll try to stay in Dynamesh pretty much until the end if I can, uh, because it is what is the fastest way to iterate. So I hope this was useful for you and I hope that you learned a few things by watching this video. I thank you for your time. I thank you for uh, watching this and if you like this kind of content and you want to see more of it, please subscribe.